Welcome to Lisbon in Portugal, a quaint and lovely country that's surprisingly underrated, especially in relation to its neighbor in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain. Indeed, it's hard to believe that at one point in history, Portugal was the largest maritime empire in the entire world, with colonies in Asia, Africa, and South America. In this first of a two-part series, we join Trafalgar for a guided holiday across the Atlantic coast of Portugal. We'll take in the sights and sounds of the capital Lisbon and stop over at the picturesque fish board of Nazaré to try authentic seafood cuisine, offer prayers at the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima and end in Porto, UNESCO World Heritage Site and architectural gem at the mouth of the River Douro. So join us as we explore Portugal. I'm David Saldran and this is Executive Class. <laughs> Lisbon. It's what travel writers are calling Western Europe's best kept secret. Here's why. The Portuguese capital has everything Europe's most popular tourist destinations have. Grand monuments, elegant squares, world-class shopping and globally recognized art and cuisine. All that, but in a much more intimate scale that gives Lisbon its unique charm and inimitable quaintness. Lisbon is Western Europe's oldest capital, older than Paris and London, actually. But it was only in the late 15th century that the story of Lisbon as a global city begins. So this is our first stop in Lisbon. It's the Belay Tower, Belém Tower, really. And this is where you can say it all began for the Empire of Portugal. The Tower of Belém is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a reminder of Portugal's golden age of discovery. The fortress was a starting point of voyages to the New World, and for many sailors, the last sight of their homeland. Built along the Tagus River in 1515, it guarded the entrance to Lisbon, then the wealthiest city and the preeminent maritime power in Europe at the time. Lisbon was a big metropolis in, in, in Europe. It was considered the four, the, among the four largest cities in Europe, together with Paris, London and Naples. And it was extremely wealthy because not only the ivory, the gold, uh, the precious stones, then the spices and the tea and the chocolate and all these wonderful products that were brought from overseas. So it was a very special, um, very cosmopolitan with a lot of people coming from all over. But according to Isabel, this golden age was short-lived, lasting less than 200 years. It was a brief moment of glory, but you still feel it today, don't you? That very global uh, kind of uh, atmosphere uh, absolutely. of Absolutely. Portuguese are open minds, I would say. Uh, uh, yes, That's absolutely. the legacy of the, that age of legacy exploration. Legacy of that age. A visit to the Monument to the Discoveries helps you understand where the Portuguese trait of openness to the world comes from. This is the Monument of the Discoveries. It's a tribute to Henry the Navigator, the Portuguese partly responsible for building Portugal's overseas maritime empire. And this is a map of that empire. Prince Henry, nicknamed the Navigator, developed nautical science and funded voyages to seek new trade routes to the New World. His legacy is inscribed on this map, the discovery of the sea lane circumnavigating the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, which paved the way for the Portuguese colonies in South India, Southeast Asia, and coastal China, and a westward route to its top prize, Brazil and South America. Each voyage brought back untold riches, wealth that built Lisbon, and grand structures like the Monastery of Geronimus. The monastery is another UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's listed for its richly ornate style, integrating nautical themes. 
a late Gothic architectural trend known as Manuelin, named after King Manuel I, who used a tax on maritime trade to build magnificent structures like it. Most of the Hieronymite order were housed here and tasked to pray for the success of voyages and the safe return of Portuguese sailors. King Manuel's descendants are entombed here, as are the nation's most celebrated navigators. This is a sarcophagus of Vasco da Gama, the famous Portuguese explorer who discovered the very important trade route from Portugal to India. From the 15th to 17th centuries, Lisbon would enjoy unrivaled grandeur. But a huge earthquake in 1755 flattened most of the city, ending its golden age. From the Praça de Comercio in Lisbon's waterfront to the streets and squares of Baixa Pambolina beyond, all this is pretty new, reconstructed after the earthquake, with an urban design based on a grid pattern with wide avenues and public squares copied by cities like Paris later on. We owe this forward-looking urban planning to the first Marques de Pombal, whose statue gazes over the new city he designed, and whose monument symbolizes the new spirit of Lisbon rising after the earthquake. Inspired by his work, modern Lisbon is one of the most walkable and livable cities on the continent. The Avenida da Liberdade's wide tree-lined sidewalks are a joy to stroll on. It's the city's version of Paris's Champs-Élysées, a mile-long stretch of road with pedestrian lanes decorated with two-tone mosaic-like abstract patterns of stone that's common throughout Portugal in its colonies. Along the wide avenue are some of Lisbon's most handsome mansions. Those are painted in bright colors and adorned with decorative tiles. The Libertades ends at the picturesque Restauradores Square. It's where you'll find one of Lisbon's favorite icons, the tram, which functions like a funicular to get to the higher parts of town. The square is surrounded by historic, neoclassical, and art deco buildings. But don't get too excited yet, because there's much more to see. A few more steps, and you're at the elegant and expansive Praça Rocio, with its monument Dom Pedro, King of Portugal, and the familiar wave-like patterns of stones that cover the square. Massive Baroque water fountains help cool the mid-Atlantic air. If in a hurry, you can hop on a tram which takes you through the Baixa Pombalina, among the most photogenic parts of town. Otherwise, do as most Lisbuans do, slow down and pace yourself. After all, this flat part of town is ideal for walking, with broad sidewalks and pedestrian-only streets that reveal all sorts of attractions. Painted tiles called Azulejo, on building facades are a favorite of mine. No two are alike, and they glow beautifully in the sunlight. The cast iron Santa Justa outdoor elevator is another delight. Built by an apprentice of Gustav Eiffel, it's also the first of its kind, and it's still used to get from Baja, or the lower town, to neighborhoods like Bairro Alto on higher ground. Parts of Lisbon were built on hillsides. Old trams are perfect for making the climb up towards the artsy neighborhood of Alfama. You can walk like I did for a better view of the city's medieval quarter and of Lisbon's red-tiled rooftop and breathtaking waterfront. Alfama survived a great earthquake unscathed, so streets remain as they were in medieval days, narrow, twisted, and in corners of Bohemian Alfama, colorfully spray-painted. Be rewarded for that uphill climb with some of the best views of Lisbon atop the medieval fortress St. George's Castle, just as the sun is going down. Like neighboring Spain, streets stay alive at night. Bairro Anto, also on a hillside, is best known for its gritty streetscape alternative lifestyle, and colorful nightlife. 
And for Fado especially, an intensely soulful vocal and acoustic performance that you must definitely see. When in Lisboa, you must visit one of the many Fado houses. These are traditional taverns where the melancholic Portuguese song, the Fado, is sung. And Luso is one of many in the Bairro Alta district of the city. Many Fado houses are on the touristy side, so it's mostly hit and miss. But Luso, where Lisbon's most respected Fado stars used to perform, is highly recommended. And Trafalgar includes a Fado performance over dinner here. This is pretty good. It's one of many bacalao or salted codfish recipes we'll come across throughout our trip. Dinner is fine so far, but it's the fado that's the real star. Fado is unique to Portugal, and in Lisbon, the songs are usually about sadness and longing. No one can say where fado first came from. Perhaps it's rooted in the lamentations of sailors leaving their homeland, or from poor Brazilian immigrants. Fado is an intimate peek at the multifaceted Portuguese soul, just one of many sides of this fascinating society and its complex history. Dinner was great, but that Fado experience was truly memorable, truly moving. It's an authentic art form that's beloved by the Portuguese people. It's not hard to see why. You'll need more days to explore Lisbon, but we've got a packed itinerary ahead. After the break, we continue along the Atlantic coastline to Navarre for a typical Portuguese lunch with breathtaking views of the ocean. And then, we'll drop by Fatima for a few prayers and end our journey in the port city of Porto, where Portugal's most famous wine and architectural gems await.